it's a random piece of Z. You're not supposed to read or understand this, don't worry. I was tempted to do a quiz like Paul this morning, that would be really fun. Uh, so we have an English description at the top, okay, and some, some mathematics underneath. Uh, we call this structure here in the box a schema. Uh, at the top, we've got some variables with some types, and down here below the line, <coughs> we have a, a mathematical relationship between the variables. We generate these documents in two ways. Okay? So we generate these documents so they just have the English part at the top without any of the mathematics. For a readership that doesn't want the mathematics, it just wants to read the English. And that English has to work as a flowing prose just like on its own. We also generate it with the mathematics. The mathematics adds uh, more detail. Okay? Uh, hopefully it doesn't contradict the English, but adds more detail to it. So we've got... Uh, 4,250 pages of Z spec on this project. Okay, so it's about this big if you print it out. Okay, nobody understands the whole lot in their head at the same time. It's big. Okay, if anybody knows a bigger one, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. Now, as far as I know, it's the biggest Z spec out there. Okay, everything flows from the Z spec. Okay, it's the common point of the project. So we design from it, we code from it. Uh, we do our test architecture and we test from it. Okay, makes it a critical point in the project, so it's reviewed thoroughly. Okay, it's reviewed by engineers, it's reviewed by the customer. When I say the customer, it's reviewed by air traffic controllers <coughs> who are going to be using the system. Okay, we've taught them enough to do that. It's reviewed by the domain experts. It's reviewed by the people who will be maintaining even the hardware the system runs on. Mm. So Leah was talking a little bit about training earlier, um, an absence of training, or. or, or uh, Patchiness of training is maybe, maybe fairer. Um, so let's talk a little bit about training here. How do we get a body of Z engineers? Um, oh, no, that sounds like a really bad form of this disaster, a body of Z engineers. Uh, how do we get a, uh, uh, a group of skilled Z engineers? Um, so the first thing to acknowledge is that reading and writing Z is very different, OK? And we, we, uh, we, we carefully partition the people who need to write Z and the people who need to read Z, and we train them differently. So Z, Z Reader's course is, is three A's. Okay? And then we have fluency after about a week on the job. Okay? To define fluency, what I mean by fluency is, is sort of the point where you're someone who's come off a training course is pretty much indistinguishable from someone who's been using the skill for six months a year. Okay? So pretty much there. Okay? We find three days, three days training and then, and then a week of mentored on the, on the job pretty much gets them there for reading Z. We've trained uh, just over 75 people now to read Z. Um, Slide is, is slightly out of date since I have David Cooper in Bangalore at the moment running a Z course, so it's probably 70, 77 and a half people at the moment, something like that. Um, and that includes obviously engineers, software engineers, hardware engineers, also includes domain experts and crucially air traffic controllers. Okay? We have air traffic controllers who we have trained to read Z to make sure they understand the system we're building and can tell us if it's right or wrong. Okay? Writing Z is different, uh, still a three day course, but we find the fluency takes a lot longer to achieve. Okay? Again, fluency meaning yeah, uh, the person who's been on the course is doing it as well as somebody who's been doing it for years. Fluency takes longer to write Z. So we trained, trained 11 people. We had a large pool, pool of people who have uh, written Z already, so we didn't really change them. We only trained engineers to write Z. Our Z spec is written in Microsoft Word. Okay. This doesn't mean we love Microsoft Word. Okay. Um, historically, we've used technologies such as LaTeX for writing Z specifications. One of the things we've discovered is if you're trying to take a body of people and teach them Z and simultaneously teach them LaTeX, which isn't a WYSIWYG environment like they're used to, you're just trying to take them too far in one go. Okay? You really need to be selective about the, the battles you fight here. Okay? So we use Word because it's familiar to a lot of the people and a lot of our customers who are using it and are already there. That means we can just focus on teaching them Z. Okay? Uh, so we have a word template, it includes a Z font, it includes the ability to kick off the fuzz type checker um, <coughs> and link back errors. It includes the ability to launch a graphical analysis tool which shows you some linkage and structure of the specification, a little bit like uh, uh, coupling cohesion for, for your code. <coughs> In terms of advantages of using Word, it's very easy to develop the English commentary and the Z together and particularly the hyperlinking, uh, so the linking back of fuzz errors into the, into the Z specification is, is great. It makes it a very efficient way to run fuzz. Turns out we now run fuzz far more like we run the examiner. We run fuzz little and often as we develop the spec rather than as a big bun activity at the end. Disadvantages are basically the disadvantages of big word documents. Um, the tools slow down, big word documents are somewhat fragile. In particular, this bottom one, uh, merging of branches. So with a project this big, 
we have to be scrupulously careful to have a, a, a stable core Z specification, a stable code base, a stable test base. So all of our engineers, be they specifiers, developers, testers, work on branches. Word stores its, stores, uh, its material in binary files, which of course gives you great problems when you come to merge a branch back into the stable trunk. Okay? We are reliant on using Word to do the merge. Um, we've got some, some options, some, uh, some possible research ways forward. In particular, using if we switch to OpenOffice and store our Z specifications in XML, there's a possibility of writing a Z syntax and semantics aware tool to actually merge that <coughs> XML, which might help us quite a lot in this area. Okay, so I talked about state machines for the HMI. Um, I couldn't find a, a small pot of state machine, but uh, this is fairly straightforward. We list states down one side, we list elements of the UI across the top. Okay. And if you press button 1 in state 2, it goes back to state 1. That's all there is to it. Okay. We list transi transition actions, so when you go from state 1 to state 2, you deselect checkbox 1. Okay. It's all very straightforward stuff. Okay. We could obviously draw this as a state machine okay, and animate it if we wanted. We don't. Okay. We find we get more material on the pages by doing tables, and we find the value of drawing them and animating them just, just doesn't pay back. Okay. This is very much for the look and feel of the HMI. So underneath this, we tie it straight into the Z. So a button press, you find often you'll find in the transition action, a button press is uh, the trigger for a Z operation to, to happen. Uh, the uh, a text field displayed on the HMI will be an output field from a Z operation. It's very much tied together. And this leads to a very clear code mapping if you wanted to. Uh, you can do an implementation in switch statements or case statements that, that is very easily reviewable to this. In terms of training and tools for this one, the slide is a bit shorter. Um, generally, we don't even need to train people on this, they just get it. Okay? And, and we, don't, we don't tool support it. There's some consistency checking, etc. we could do, but we don't at the moment. The beauty of these state machines for this, this kind of look and feel specification is, quite frankly, the sheer simplicity of it. So move on to, uh, to the implementation phase. At risk of shocking the audience, I'm going to pass, this, pass up this opportunity to extol the virtues of Spark, um, <coughs> mainly because I think the audience is fairly Spark aware, and of course all the, uh, all the previous uh, presenters today have pretty much done it for me actually, which is great. Um, so in, in a very short summary, Spark is an annotated subset of ADA. It's designed for people who want their programs to be demonstrably safe, or demonstrably secure, or frankly just to be correct. Um, on this project we have 150,000 logical source lines of code. Okay. Counting lines of code is, is, is almost as dangerous as go-to's. It depends how you do it. So this is logical lines of code counted by Gnat metric. Okay. Um, managers like counting physical lines of code because, of course, the number's bigger and then the number you write per day is higher. Because it's Spark, we get uh, things like freedom of deadlock. You know, it's, it's Raven Spark, so we get freedom of deadlock, freedom of live lock proofs for free. We don't do anything to get that. It's just Spark, so we just know we have freedom from deadlock. We do do a proof of runtime exception, uh, absence of runtime exception. Gosh, that's completely different. We prove an absence of runtime exceptions. Uh, and uh, harking back to Paul's continuous integration comments this morning, we actually generate the VCs, we generate the absence of runtime exception VCs every night. We generate just over 100,000 VCs every night, okay, which sounds quite bad. The good news is we also discharge 100,000 VCs every night. Okay. Uh, if there are any hiccups, if there are any that have crept into the system in the day before, then our team in Bangalore, who are obviously working before the UK team, can, can get on top of those and get those fixed before the UK team comes in. So we use the time zones to help us in doing that. But effectively, our, our formal continuous integration is by, is by doing the absence proof every night. Okay. 